Good evening. Good evening, folks. How is everyone? Hope you're all doing well. So I just want to spend a couple minutes with you. And we won't be long tonight, I promise. <laughs> I usually say that and we go for hours. I, I don't have it in the tank tonight. Uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit because I got a lot of questions as to why I was not pointing anything specific out in the PM session. Well, obviously, you can see by my recording, I was engaged and it was very focus demanding. So it was very, uh, very hard for me to you know, do more than one thing at a time and being able to type out a, a tweet and prepare a chart and, and add all that stuff while it's all moving around. Like it, I had to be dialed in. And it was a very complex model. Obviously, you can see that now. <clears throat> but uh, none of you are at that level where you should be expecting to trade like that. And really, here's the main thing. You don't want to be trading in environments like that. Like it's very stressful. It's time demanding. It's exhausting. And there's other ways to trade on better days. And I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, that was really the main reason why I wanted to sit down because I'm going to be away from you all tomorrow morning. The, the afternoon today was one of those days where Unless you have a lot of experience and you know exactly what you're doing, it, it's next to impossible. Even if I was to sit there and tell you every individual level, the fact that it was going back and forth, chopping back and forth, deep retracements and such, it would have confused you. More people would have been upset and frustrated trying to track it and follow it than me just simply just executing, managing it and annotating it as I go. The morning session, I think, was pretty nice. I mean, we had a pretty straightforward run to that 40-30 level we were looking for last week. And then I opened up our commentary on the weekend saying that was my next upside objective. And then the morning session was kind of sloppy uh, pre-market. I said, let's just wait and see what we get after the opening bell. And I gave this very specific candle to look for for your fair value gap. and then. Obviously, I executed on that as well. What I found interesting is, and you should be finding this is equally interesting, uh, there are folks that are following me on Twitter that are actually taking the trades based on their understanding, and I did not get them in the trade. And to me, I think that's fascinating. I was sharing some of the videos that folks were putting up in my Twitter space. Well, not my Twitter space, but my Twitter timeline responding to you know, the one I, I shared my execution with. <clears throat> and my sons were like, you know, that's awesome. You know, to be able to see some of you taking the initiative to record yourself doing it. And it, it's fun. Once you do it a few times and you, you get the feel for what it is you're, you're doing, it's a great way to journal too. Like there's no better way than to have an actual you know, movement of you in and out of the marketplace. That fluid entry management and exit, that is absolutely the highest form of journaling because you're actually doing the process. You're annotating the chart as it goes. You'll remember it. Like I remember every, every fluctuation today in ES in the morning session in the afternoon. And some of the questions were like, you know, how did I know it was going to do certain things? And how did I know it wasn't going to do other things? Well, <clears throat> at the risk of sounding like, you know, well, typical me, it takes a lot of time, obviously. Okay. And also you have to know it like the back of your hand, like anything else. I mean, if you, I'm not a mechanic, like I, I, I own a lot of cars. But I couldn't fix one to save my own life. Like, I, I don't know anything about them. So my checkbook covers the expenses for those types of things because I don't know them like the back of my hand. I spent my entire life doing this and developing algorithms and doing things that would bring more precise understanding, insight, execution, 
delivery. And, you know, I'm, I'm pulling that veil back, you know, letting you see what goes on. And I, I see these folks and believe I'm not, I'm not troubled by this. Okay. But I'm, I'm fascinated still, even with this degree of showing you where it's going to go, telling you what candle to focus on and it, and it's live. Like you can't do better than that. You can't cherry pick that. Okay. But I got a challenge for all of you out there that like to say these types of things. And any of you that don't really subscribe to the view that people that don't like what we're doing or whatever, I would like for you to set out a task for yourself to try to cherry pick and execute like you see me doing. You can use as many computer screens as you want, but do it like I'm doing it. I would love to see that. I absolutely would love to see it, but it has to be in live market data. It can't be in market replay. Okay. Cause I'm not doing market replay as you can see. So anyway, it's a challenge out there for the guys that like to talk all that shit. But I think that, you know, for the folks that have been on the fence about what it is that I do, how I teach, what the benefit of it is, what's the, uh, you know, what's the outcome of putting in all this work? What's the, what's the payback for deferring all of your weekends and your evenings watching sports and such? I know some of you still sneak and do that, <laughs> but you have a lot of study time, a lot of work that you got to put into this year. I'm putting it in there too. So you're going to be expected to be studying much more than the average person, even more than what I put my mentorship through, because I'm going to be giving you, obviously, you know, live sessions. You got to go through those and there's going to be commentary every day, Monday through Friday. And there'll be also homework assignments. And I'll try to be brief about what it is I want you to focus on. But if you don't do them, and if you're just going to be the type of person that just waits to see what everybody else tweets and responds to me, and just say, okay, well, that was, that was equivalent to me doing it. I get it now. That's why a lot of folks that watch my content, you know, they want to hear the summary. Give me the summary. Give me the cliff notes. Give me the you know, the PDF that's condensed down to one paragraph. So that way I ain't got to worry about watching all this stuff or listening to this guy. And what you see me doing in my executions and management and identifying what it is I'm expecting in the marketplace, typing it out in, in annotations. You, you'll never get that unless you listen to why I'm doing certain things when I don't like to see certain things and market environments. You know, certain market environments that are prone to produce conditions that are just, you know, unfavorable, difficult even for me. And this afternoon, that was difficult for me. I mean, you might look at that and say, well, shit. I mean, you were all over that thing like white on rice. I was still telling my son that was walking up to me and wanting to ask me a question. I said, not now. My wife came up to the office and she says, hey, um, and I said, not now. And of course, I'm dead now. <laughs> I got to pay the price when I when I you know, join her in in the typical evening. You know, you know what husband and wives do. I'm going to be punished. <laughs> but I was trying to dial in, and you know, I just I have to have an absolute 100 percent undivided attention when it's like that. And because it's very difficult for me to have that being you know wired the way i am i try to avoid those conditions and to make it easy for me not to have to do a lot of those types of trading environments for teaching i just teach my students to try to avoid those conditions so one might look at that and say well that's a shortcut it is it saves me a lot of insanity because i know well look at just look what i was doing you know, I could literally teach just the afternoon session I did today. I could spend the rest of this year teaching all of that. Just that one session, what I was doing. That's how deep this shit gets. Like, it's a lot. There's a lot of things that are going on. And you don't see that. You don't know what's going in my decision-making, what, what processes I'm going through in my mind. All on a one-minute chart. Still annotating. Still keeping my train of thought about what it is I'm watching. So. 
there's a lot of things going on. And there's no fucking way that I could be doing that with another screen typing it in something. It, I'm, I'm constantly doing that one screen. When I mark it and to a level, I've already called. And when I sent you a little uh, tweet with the smiley face, we were getting our sell side liquidity pools tagged. And then right before I started this stream, or not stream, but this Twitter space, it hit the 3996.75 level. Cleared out that sell side liquidity and sent you a screenshot before I signed on to this. You have to be doing those types of things. In, in the early stages, you might think, well, <laughs> big deal. This, he's bragging. I'm not bragging. I don't need to brag. I'm, I'm, I'm really good at this. I don't need to brag about it. I've lived it. What I'm teaching you to do is screenshot it like I'm showing you. So that way you can save these moments in your journal. Because we talked about very specific price levels. I'm not ambiguous. I'm not saying up and down. I'm taking your attention to right to a specific level, not a zone. Because if you don't understand what it's going to gravitate towards, you have no chance in being consistent. You'll be like the people out there on YouTube that are starting their live streams at $4,800 and shitting themselves all day long thinking they're smart. You can't do those types of things. You can't. You have to go in, look for specific things to repeat. How do you know that they're going to repeat? By screenshotting them. Screenshot them over and over and over again. And what it does is it gives you a snapshot of a memory that once you look at it again and with annotations on it, saying, you know, this is the sell side liquidity you're looking for, not just a blank chart at that level. And like, you have to dress the chart up. That way it records the moment of what it is that you were expecting to see in price. And that little tiny photograph is like, to me, they're, they're in many ways, they're like pictures of my children. You know, when, when I have my algorithm constantly giving me photo opportunities, you know, I still do it. You know, I may be out and about with my wife. I may be doing other things. If I see it on my phone, a screen, a screenshot it. Now, I know what I'm looking for, but you don't necessarily know what you're looking for because you're so new. So you want to spend time doing this a lot when price is going to go to our levels, when I'm specifically calling a level. I'm teaching you to predict a bias. Now, earlier today when I sent out the tweet, I said, you know, as long as we are beneath the 1040 uh, fair value gap. If we're below that, then I'm going to be looking for the 4,000 and the 3,096.75 sell side liquidity pool. Notice I gave you very specific levels, not you know some random area or a zone. It's very specific levels. Now. We didn't get the levels delivered to during the day session. We had to wait for the six o'clock restart when the futures market you know, takes the hour off from five to six o'clock every day. But it opened up, immediately dismounted. So admittedly, I don't like to hold over during that break because anything can happen. I mean, they could drop bombs somewhere, you know, something, you know, anything can happen. And that's what makes me love more than anything now that I am a proficient day trader and not being willing to hold overnight. I don't, I don't want to do those types of things anymore. It's too much risk. The gap risk in doing that, there's no way of measuring it. Like it could do crazy things. And if you're trading and holding size, yeah, an unfavorable opening could undo you quickly. And it's not something you want to really invite the, the that that level of risk on. And I want to mention something um, for folks that are wanting to focus on things that are outside day trading. Now, the things I'm teaching you in day trading is the same thing that you can apply to a daily chart in a four hour. So while it's not conducive for those types of trades right now, and, and that's how we're going to close the video, or not to be here, but the discussion here tonight about where we are and why I'm taking tomorrow morning off. The, 
the present state of the marketplace right now doesn't permit me to feel confident about trading even short term, which is kind of like that was kind of like my my forte short term trading one shot one kill get in hold it for a couple of days and then you know, try to get the lines portion of the weekly range. I have shifted away from that over the last two and a half three years. I've I've moved and migrated away from that to adapt to the increased risk that's in the marketplace right now. If things were to get better, then I would obviously go back to that mindset because it's a lot less work. Commission costs are extremely lower than what lots and lots of intraday trades are. And you see lots of executions being done. You see guys out there doing like 40 contracts and 24 contracts and 16 contracts and they show you they made a thousand dollars or two thousand by the end of the day you don't realize it because you're not seeing it but if you factor in all the fees and the commissions they end up making nothing and sometimes are actually losing money so that's the reason why i do very specific models where the one i go to for all of you most of the time is i start with six contracts and then i'll split that for my second entry to pyramid my position, I'll go in with three contracts, dropping that down into one contract on my third partial. So I'm pyramiding in three positions to one trade, to a 10 lot or 10 contract position. Sometimes, sometimes I'll roll it up to 18 contracts. Sometimes, but not all of them are 18 contract type setups. And sometimes they're not all 10 contract setups. Do you go out there with a funded account just simply because you get to that point and start trading like that because you see me doing it? I don't believe you should. I believe you should just do one contract. Because knowing how to pyramid, build your positions up, that comes with a great deal of experience. And too many times folks think they have that skill set and they quickly find out they don't. And then when they don't have it, that frustration makes them feel like that's the only way they could have been profitable. And that's a lie. That's something that plagued me early on when I was trying to build in pyramiding. I mean, back in the 90s, when I was trying to do these things in bonds and S&P, it was scary for me to do it because I was doing it the opposite direction. Or not direction, but I was going with one contract and doing two contracts on my second entry and then four contracts on the next one and then eight contracts on the next one. See how fast you're building the position up and very little movement against you has a great deal compounded effort in drawdown. Versus where I start with my largest position that makes the most sense, which is less than one and a half percent usually. And then what I'll do is I'll build in. The largest position entry first, split it in half, put the next one in as I have equity or if I feel like I'm scaling in a better position size that I'm getting more insight like you watched me do today in the PM session. I was literally putting on entry signals or, or trades. Every one of those could have been your unique model. Every single one of them. So that's how many trades I can see in a small fractal on a one minute chart. And it's even more when you drop it down to a 15 second chart. You get four of those candles per minute. So it allows me to have a great deal number of opportunities and setups as long as I know where the market's likely to go. And it's the time of the day when it should deliver. Morning session hours, evening session hours, you know, PM session. I'm confident I'll find a setup every single day. And you're being made privy to what it is I'm using as the draw, like the magnet on price, that that idea of what makes price go where and why. That's the experience I'm lending. I'm telling you the future with my 30 years of experience of knowing where it's likely to go next. And because I'm teaching you by showing you example after example, I've seen still people saying, you know, what's the point of these videos? You put videos up there with music. You know, I don't like that. I don't like when you send me a tweet like that. How about that? 
what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not going to bend to what you want me to do. I'm going to do how it entertains me. And I know it works. It may not fit you. Just turn the music off and just watch the chart and go into your own charts and annotate what you see me doing. Because if you just watch the videos, the little vignettes, the small little ones, two minutes or whatever on Twitter, and that's all you did, just watched it, you wasted your time. Because I'm showing you in a very small encapsulated portion of time an entire thought process. And I'm showing you how I'm in alignment with the algorithm. I'm placing myself exactly in the marketplace when the algorithm is going to deliver price a specific way. And just having that recording saved on your phone or saved to your computer and saying, yeah, I got that saved. It's, you know, it's in the archive of ICT. That's waste. That's doing nobody any good. So what? You have it saved. I'm not deleting anything. You don't need to, you don't need to worry about it. But you need to go into the chart in the video and match up what you see on your chart and annotate that. There may be questions about what it is that made me have a concern about that specific level. Okay. And you take that question and you put it into a topical area in your journal and you write the question out. And then you keep watching what I'm doing all year long and you're going to find the answers to those questions because I'm going to invariably answer it. And that's what I say all the time with folks that come to my channel. They're all worried about, you know, where do I start? Start wherever you want to start. I mean, really, I mean, there's no real perfect way of doing it. But if you want to, you know, take advantage of what I'm doing this year, you want to be joining what we're doing right now. Because it will force you to see what it is I'm showing you right now. You'll also see that I can do it. You'll see that the market does, in fact, go where I'm outlining beforehand. And it's fun. It's, a, it's an amazing interactive study that for a you know, number of six years or so, only my private group had the opportunity to see this type of stuff. And we did this every day, every single day for years, every single day. Okay. And you've probably listened to people and heard people or seen things that were made up and photoshopped and contrived and were conjectures on people's uh, or opinions for folks that were never with us in our community. Okay. I've opened up and now showed all of you and you're, you're getting to see it. So it, hopefully it encourages you. Hopefully it's not just a matter of, you know, being viewed as me showing off because I can show off. Believe me, this ain't showing off. I'm teaching you and I'm giving you example after example every single day, every single week of these things repeating. So that way, number one, the concern that most of you have is that, you know, can anyone do this? Forget that you don't know how to do it yet because everybody doubts whether or not they're going to be able to do it. But the question is, do you have someone teaching you that can do it because if I can't do it. If I can't prove it, if I can't show you what it's likely to do and I can't execute and I can't manage a trade with a stop loss and build in a larger position. How many times have you seen me do it? It's the same thing every time. Precision, precision, precision. And it's going to levels I've outlined beforehand. So it's allowing you to take the fears and the anxiety that you have, which is reasonable. That's, that's normal to have that in the beginning. Everyone has that. But I go out of my way to try to make it, well, encouraging. Because even though you know in your, in your heart you can't do what I'm doing right now, you know that I can, so therefore I am an authority in this because I can show you and I can tell you beforehand what it's going to do. And because I'm doing it repeatedly every single week, that shows consistency, it shows continuity, and it shows prowess. So that way it dismisses and disarms, in my opinion it should, the students that are guarded. They feel like, I don't want to do too much investment of my time and energy in this because this could be a scam. <laughs> oh, shit. If, if you can't see this now being exactly what I've always said, 
honestly, even the live streams aren't going to do it for you. It's not. And it's fine. You know, I, you know, if some of you don't want to learn this, that's fine. You don't have to. There's plenty of room for the folks that want to learn it. And it ain't going to diminish the effectiveness if you don't do. I'm going to still do it whether you like to do it or not. And I believe that if I had this coming up, like I would literally be walking around like bouncing, you know, excited. Because when I was first learning, I didn't believe this type of precision, consistency, foresight, and understanding about what price is going to do. I didn't believe that was even possible. I thought it was just like, well, once in a while people get lucky. This ain't luck. This is technical science. These things are measurable, they're repeatable, and it's a transferable skill. Look in my timeline. You can see folks that did these trades themselves. Not exactly like mine, obviously not to that degree, but they were still getting in the trades without me telling them how to do it. You know how they got there? Logging, journaling, studying, back testing, all the boring things that most of the students that come to me and quit or fail or complain or just say, well, you know, this guy's probably a fraud because I couldn't learn how to do this. He complicates it. How, how complicated is knowing a level that it's going to likely to reach to? Wait for a displacement in price in that direction. Wait for a fair value gap to form. Wait for it to return back up into that fair value gap if it's going to go lower. And then engage it. Put the stop above the fair value gap. And then ride it out. How hard is that? Like, that's the easiest way of trading there is. You don't need any trend lines. You don't need any kind of indicators. You don't need anything except for reading price. Like, that's easy. There's nothing simpler than that. There's nothing out there simpler than that. You don't even need to put a moving average on here. What do you need a moving average for? You already know what the draw of liquidity is. It's dumb. You don't, need a, you don't need a moving average. You need none of that stuff. You need a clock that has the right time for New York time. And you need to open high, low, and close. That's it. One minute, five minute, 15 minute, hourly chart, four hour chart, or daily. Whatever you want to use, they'll all deliver price. But a move on a four hour chart isn't going to have as many opportunities to enter and engage that a one and five minute chart would. Like I can get in all kinds of trades and build up a position, enormous position, like putting new links on a chain from the, the main parent entry and all the subordinate entries that would be after that one. It's just simply just adding another link. So it's a chain reference from where I'm entering to where I'm thinking it's gonna go. And that link of chain is just adding more, well, links to the, to the chain from where I, want, uh, where I want to be in the marketplace initially and where I believe the market's gonna go or terminus, final target. So, I'm, I'm having fun doing this, okay? I just want to let you all know I'm having a lot of fun. My wife thinks I'm spending too much time doing it, but I told her, I said, you know, I, I, I warned you. I told you what I was getting ready to get into, and this is it. This is the last year I'm going to do it. But I'm having fun, and I see the feedback, and I see the folks that are really engaging and studying and, and proving that they're you know, putting forth the effort, not just casually Netflix viewers. And now I feed off of that, like that, that gets me going, like it, it motivates me. But I don't want any of you to take what I'm showing you in these examples as you're going to be able to trade just like that after this year. That, that, that will not happen. That won't happen. But you will be able to use that model I taught last year on YouTube for free. You'll be able to, you'll be able to trade that model proficiently. Without a doubt, you'll absolutely know what you're doing. You'll know how to you know, determine the bias. You'll be able to tell the bias for the day. You'll be able to tell the weekly expansion direction where the most you know, expansion will occur for that week coming. And you'll know the bias for each individual session and you'll know when to avoid it. And I think if you learn those skill sets and you have done the work in studying what my entry criteria is for a fair value gap, a breaker, an order block, optimal trade entry, something to that effect. Um, 
you'll have what you need and you won't need to do anything else. You won't have to, you know, stay hand in hand with me. You won't have to keep coming to my channel and you won't have to go to anybody for anything. You'll be an independent free thinker and you'll know exactly how to engage. And over time, when you get to the point when you can get to a funded account and you can withdraw money or you have your own money and you trade with live funds when you decide to do so on your own, once you start taking in that kind of extra stream of income, it encourages you. It makes you feel worthy. It makes you feel more capable as, as an adult. And it gives you confidence that even though things are getting expensive and they're going to get even more expensive, you don't have to worry about falling behind in inflation because the skill set you're learning is going to always outpace inflation. Like, do you, do you foresee yourself worrying about the price of gas per gallon if you can make, not just in a day, but let's just say you can make uh, you know, five figures in a week. Are you going to spend much time at all worrying about the cost of gasoline or the cost of a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread or clothing for you or your children? You're not going to worry about those things. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to provide a way for you to get that skill set so that way you can live a little bit more comfortable life. I'm not promising you're going to get rich. The apt pupil can see the opportunity for something like that, but I can't in good conscience promise that. But I can promise that you will learn how to reprice. You'll be consistently able to reprice. The default and result of that is whatever you want to make it. If you want to build this up to a big, you know, monstrosity in terms of trading revenue, who says you can't do that? Who says you can't? So it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of what you're doing this for. And I don't want any of you to see what it is I'm showing you and think, okay, well, this is what he's promising I'm going to be able to do at the end of the year. No, you're going to be able to do one solid setup per week, one good setup that you're going to be able to find. Without a doubt, you will find one that will at least, at least attack one of the ma major expenses you have for each month. And that's usually the rent or the mortgage payment. And recently, groceries is getting real close to the average uh, mortgage or rent payment now. So if you could have that coming in you know, each month, that is a huge weight off your back, anyone's back, right? So I'm, I'm trying to start you like that. Get you know low hanging fruit objective. Think about what I showed in that ends series. You make an ends meet. That that mindset that was what I was cultivating leading into this year. So that way you know why you're doing what you're doing. You're not trying to be the biggest re you know recipient of a payout. That's not what any of you should be aspiring to do right now. Largely because the markets are very difficult. Right now, these markets, I have never, okay? Listen, your teacher, your mentor, Mr. Everything, Mr. Wonderful. This is the hardest the markets have ever been in 30 years of my engagement with them. I've never had markets this choppy. Uh, this reluctant to to move, it's spending a whole lot of time doing time distortion. You call it chop and consolidation, but it's entering longer phases of just meandering around. And you have to you have to be very careful in these conditions because even though there's a potential for the market to move, they can be delayed. And the move take effect and do it in shorter time. But if you weren't on right then and there, you missed the entire thing. So it requires you to be, number one, patient. You need to be nimble, being able to get in and get out. And also, you have to have the skill set of knowing the condition that you're about to enter 
or that you maybe have just entered a trade and you realize once you get in, oh no, I'm in the mud. Like I'm I'm stuck. Like it's molasses. It's it's real sticky. It won't let you move around. And as soon as you identify that, you know, as a new student, the best thing you can do is just collapse the trade and just view it as you protected yourself. You know, it's like uh, you know playing cards or poker. You know, you know you got a hand. The chances of you winning with that hand is probably very slim. So are you going to bet more money? Some people do. They try to bluff. There's a lot of people in the industry as gurus and teachers and such, and they compete with one another. And they like to bluff, bluff, bluff. Um, y- you don't want to bluff, you know, or try to dare the market, you know, to, to arm wrestle you. And by you putting more money into the marketplace or opening your stop loss or removing your stop loss, uh, that would be foolish. And I, I saw I saw a comment that I don't I'm not letting comments uh, on my YouTube channel anymore. You're welcome to put a comment on Twitter because I post the link on Twitter. So if you want to leave a comment, you can do it there. Uh, it's too much babysitting on YouTube. You know, all these people scamming, pretending to be me, you know, WhatsApp phone numbers. I don't even use WhatsApp. But uh gentleman was saying, hey, you know, why did you take off your stop loss in the trade that I shared uh, the other day? I, I didn't take off my, I don't ever take my stop off. I always have a stop. And my stop reduces and gets closer to my entry as the trade moves in my favor. I'm never opening it up or removing it. But I want to talk a little bit in a couple minutes and get off here. But uh, tomorrow, if you open up your E-mini S&P daily chart, I'll give you a minute or two to to get there. The symbol on trading view is letter E S H two zero two three, and it's the daily time frame we're going to be looking at. All right. So if you look at what we've done thus far for today. We started trading for Wednesday already at six o'clock. We started trading. So it's been trading for like two hours. Yesterday, which is technically still today for me, uh, Tuesday's trading on January 17th. It created a higher high. And we traded up into December 14th's closing price on trading view. Okay. Look at the candlestick for January. 13th and January 12th. See how we have those really long wicks towards the low of each of those candles? There's really no imbalance in any of that. And we have that really long wick on December 13th. See that? So we're in a weird area for price. There's nothing really one-sided. In other words, my preferred way of trading is to look at the weekly range on a candlestick chart for the weekly chart and determine where I think the most movement is going to be higher or lower based on the directional tendency for the weekly chart to gravitate to a pool of liquidity or an imbalance above or below the marketplace. Either one, I don't care, but I'm spending most of my time looking to trade in that direction. Then I'm trying to time, if I'm bullish for the week, I'm looking to do a Monday, Tuesday, or by New York session entry long. And if I don't get that, then I defer to intraday trading. And if I don't get the daily range for a day, then I'll go into sessions and scout and do small little intraday swings per session. And that's how I've managed myself you know, throughout the years. And that's how I teach my students. I don't have, looking at the daily chart right now, I don't have a clean read on a directional bias that's high probability right now. I don't see it obviously going higher, and I don't see it obviously going lower. So because I can see no real easy directional reach for the next draw on liquidity, I'm neutral, especially now since we've done taken out 
our sell side liquidity pools, which was today's target for Tuesday's trading. I was able to capital, capitalize on the PM session, but I was not able to see beyond that. And I still don't. I, I have no idea what to expect going into tomorrow. I don't know what to expect going into London. Now, for some of you, that's like, what the hell he just say? Did ICT said, he just said he doesn't know something. Right. It happens sometimes. I can't get a read on what price is going to do right now because it's in an area of conflict. Either side can't be argued as a potential draw. And I can't sell or buy with anything that's in the chart on the daily. Yes, there's a swing high forming potentially. If Wednesday has the lower high that we have right now than what we had on Tuesday's trading. But by that alone, doesn't give me anything. It doesn't give me enough information to, to build a narrative that would lead to a bias, that would lead to a high probability, low resistance liquidity run. So that's the, that's the process. That's my internal dialogue. The, the analyst in me goes through those processes. And I'm telling you, the, the analyst, the inner circle trader, the, the, the brain behind this you know, motor mouth, is communicating to you in uncertain terms that there is nothing of high probability right now. So tonight into London and going into tomorrow morning, there may be something that forms that can't be seen in charts right now. I still won't be there to see it because I'm removing myself from it. I'm going to be doing things in my personal life instead of doing that. So I'm going to get caught up doing that. And then I'll look at 1.30 tomorrow in the afternoon to see if there's something that would be otherwise useful for us as a study for the PM session. Meaning that, you know, if I think a particular pool of liquidity or a specific level, I want you to study going into the close of tomorrow. You'll know it like I gave you today, like I do every day. Okay. But as of right now, I wanted to really make it a point of you hearing me say these words. Because if you're not used to me saying it, because my students that spent time with me for years, they have heard me say these phrases and and remark on times. And it's not a lot of times that I get like this, but it, you know, it's shocking to some people because they think I know everything that the market's going to do in every given second. And I don't. I just know when it is high probability, yeah, I'm going to be all over that because I know what it's likely to do. But in between those time periods, there's going to be periods of price action that doesn't really provide me a great deal of odds in my favor. So it makes me more prone to look like a retail trader, doing things in there because I have time, doing things because a pattern is there, doing things like that because somebody else has heard someone else is doing something else and, and influence. I, I'm not influenced by anybody. And you shouldn't be either. But when I tell you I'm not trying to do something, or if I say we're in low probability conditions or sit on your hands and be patient, those are the times, even if you think you're a good trader, don't do anything. Just sit still. You will learn to appreciate that throughout this year because your lack of experience in knowing how that is advantageous right now because you think that it's more, most likely uh, a better approach for you to be busy doing something, trading. You know, I've got money to make. I've got shit to do. Let me get in there and trade, trade, trade. Um, yeah. You're, you're, you can't run fast, efficiently, and use very little energy if you're running in two feet deep of mud. It's a slow, arduous task just to get your foot up out of the mud, and then your footing is going to be off because you may even lose your balance once you get the foot out of the mud. That's what it feels like, even for me, if I'm in those kind of conditions trading. And I showed you this, you know, the other day when I took two small position sizes, but I still I got stopped out on both. That's the way it would be for me too. So when I communicate to you as my students and say, "Look, 
I'm sitting on my hands. Okay. Or I may not say that. I say, sit on your hands or be patient. I'm communicating what the analyst in me is telling the trader, Michael, what to do. So the experience the analyst that has no risk in this, all he has is the task of analysis. This is your bias. This is what you're supposed to be focusing on. Don't do anything right now. Conditions are not favorable. That's the that's the role of the analyst. Sound money management. And then me, Michael, the trader, has to listen to ICT, the analyst. And I have to submit to that sound logic and that experience that guided me this far. And you see the fruits of it in my executions and my teachings and analysis. But Ratchet ICT, the one that usually manifests himself here on Twitter spaces, the foul mouth one, okay, <laughs> my alter ego, uh, that guy wants to impress everybody. Like he wants to get out there and, you know, do WWE style mentorship. And some of you like that. Um, I don't, but I use it as therapy. Sometimes it allows me to get things off my chest. And once I let go of it, then I can go about my business with my family and I won't be so high, strung or wound up. I don't feel I need, you know, obviously you can hear tonight, like I'm not all that animated tonight. I'm fatigued for most part. I'm tired. I've been going for like three days pretty solid and I'm tired. So I haven't had the opportunity to get all wound up. And, and honestly, uh, the last two days have been just, you know, just wonderful in terms of being able to teach and show you, execute, show my sons. It's just been a really nice uh, week so far. And last week was awesome too. But I don't see anything for me to lead you to study intently into London or tomorrow morning. I am aware that something might form and it might be a, an amazing trading morning or overnight it might do something amazing. I don't see it right now. So therefore, therefore, I would not look at this condition right now that we have in the daily chart where it's just simply not, there's nothing there. There's nothing there for me to say, oh, it's, it's gonna go to this daily high or this daily low. The only imbalance is if you look on the daily chart on January 11th, Wednesday, that big up candle, if you look at the candle to the right of it on Thursday, January 12th, that candle's low, and on the candle of January 10th, that candle's high. There's a small little fair value gap there. If we were to drop down, and that's, that's a considerable drop, you know, that would be a, an area for me to watch because also about midpoint of that wick on the 9th of January. Notice that hit halfway between the high and the open of January 9th candle on the daily chart of ESH2023. Uh, halfway you know, between that wick's high and the open price of that candle on the 9th is essentially the high of January 10th. So there's two factors right there. Should this thing start going down, I like that level as a like a draw on liquidity. I'm not, this is the main takeaway here, I'm not suggesting that's what's going to occur. I don't know. Right now, I don't have a clear understanding of where it will likely go. And if you go to the upside, if you consider just yesterday, or for me, Tuesday, the high, you know, it could run through Tuesday's high, but look to the left over in the uh, the 15th of December, the 14th, the 13th, like there's a whole lot of wick action there. So these are those instances, and you're going to hear me say this throughout the year. My mentorship students that have been with me for years, they know what I mean by this. But when I get in situations like this where I don't want to say, here's plan A, here's plan B. And then whatever happens, I can come back and say, see, I was smart. That's what Twitter people do. They have two outcomes. They do a squiggly line up or they do a squiggly line down. And when one of them pans out, their followers cheer them on, worship them, lift them up on a pedestal and say, you're the goat. 
And that drives me nuts because that was nothing. Anybody can do that. So while at the moment right now I have that scenario, and if I was a retail guru, I would give you the squiggly line that says it would go up to this level or it would go down to that level and then wait and see what happens. And then there it is. And you all would say the stuff that I don't like to see. But what I do with my students is I'll say these are the the problem areas I have right now because I can't, as a analyst, settle in on one side of the marketplace and go with a bias that's bullish or bearish. And because I can't do that, I can't frame a narrative. And because of that, I can't predict a low resistance liquidity run that's high probability. So where am I in terms of my analysis? I'm in a position of paralysis. I can't make a call. So if I can't make a call, I have to sit on my hands and do nothing and have no regrets about it. Zero. And new students lose their minds. When I first started teaching mentorship, the first time I did that, they were sending me emails like, what the hell you mean you don't know what you're talking about right now? There's there's always a setup. Yeah, there's always movement in price. I'm not I'm not saying that's not the case. That's clearly obvious. But there needs to be a way of framing risk, managing the risk. And does the risk invite a larger magnitude of potential profit that's going to be delivered to you within the capacity of a low resistance liquidity run? Meaning it's going to move real easy, real fast, like what I was explaining in the PM session where we would see a, a sharp cascading effect in the sell side. That move, that's a low resistance liquidity run signature. When it starts, it's like, boom, it just goes there. It's like a waterfall, just pew, or a rocket shooting up when it goes up. It's just, it's very little resistance. That's why I, I dubbed it a low resistance liquidity run. It's not out in books, you know, it, it's, this is my theory, my logic, and this is how the algorithm has been coded. So when we see price engines deliver like this, it's following that logic. And because I have no clear indication based on the things that I employ as the analyst and then engage with as the trader, I cannot allow Ratchet ICT to take the wheel tomorrow morning or stay up tonight because I'm tired and trade in conditions where I don't have favorable framework to engage in. It can get choppy. It can go against me. I could, I'm more apt to be wrong. So I have to do what? I have to remove myself from the opportunity of getting in a trade. You ask me all the time, how do you control not doing this and how do you keep from over trading in conditions and how do you identify times when you don't want to I just did it here and throughout this year when I get to those conditions and those points in analysis and and the daily calendar presents those conditions as we have right now some of you may be looking at this thing I mean I see 15 different things I could be doing okay that's you that's you I don't think like you I don't think like anybody. So I'm sharing with you the reasons why I'm taking tomorrow morning off, allowing for the market to create an environment that is more conducive for me to find a low resistance liquidity run signature in the PM session. It's a, it's a monumental moment in your career when you get to the point when you can identify that and have no fear of missing anything. No regret if it does move. And you weren't there. Who cares? When you know how to trade, trades will be made available to you. But I can't get a one-sidedness to the marketplace. Then I have to do what I'm going to tell you now. I tell my students, I say, okay, gun to my head. This is what I would favor over the opposing side. Both, both of them being equal in terms of the lack of probability being on its side, being 50-50, in other words, okay? Um, I don't like conditions like that. Like, it needs to be so overwhelmingly obvious because if it's obvious and I have more signatures 
pointing to the market moving one direction and it's very next to impossible to frame it in an opposing direction, that is my definition of a high probability trade. And in, in those high probability trade conditions, low resistance liquidity run signatures will form. The quick, easy, real fast runs to targets, that's what you're looking for as a trader. But you can't appreciate that until you see me showing you example after example after example, which is the reason why I do that. I do those little videos like that. I don't need to do those videos. I enjoy them. I could just make them and have no annotations and just trade. And, and I would entertain myself, but you would get nothing from it. I annotate them so that way you can go into your charts and dig into those areas on even a smaller time frame or go up to a higher time frame and see what those those levels provided in terms of the things I teach. So when I say gun to my head in this situation, I would favor the market trading down into half of the wick on the 13th of January, Friday 13th. So on your daily chart, you should take your Fibonacci. I'm going to do this now so that way you can make sure you're doing it right. Grab your Fibonacci and click it on the low of January 13th, that daily candle, and drag it up to the opening of the candle and drop your Fibonacci there. You should arrive at a price of 3,982.50. 3,982.50, okay? I would favor that level as something to watch going into tonight and into tomorrow. Because that's my gun to head, you know, I, idea. Because there's so much, I'm going to tell you why I'm, I've cited there. And this is not to say that this is what it's going to be. I'm telling you that my analysis is conflicted. So I'm in a neutral position right now. I'm favoring, you know, the price level I just gave you. Because of, look at the high on November 15th of 2022 on ES, on the daily chart. And then look at the high on November 25th of 2022. It's a higher high. Then we had another higher high on the 1st of December of 2022. Then we had the higher high on that big long wick on December 13th of 2022. So how many times have we reached up into a premium and each time taking out sell side liquidity? Well, if you count the high on November 15th of 2022, then that high being reached on the 25th of November, that's one time buy side was taken out. And then the same thing occurs with a higher high forming on the 1st of December. And then that high was taken out on the 13th of December. So we have seen one, two, three, four times the market reach up and it has been unable to sustain those levels. And then now when it dropped down, the only thing it took out in terms of sell side liquidity were the relative equal lows formed on November 17th of 2022. And the low of December 7th of 2022. So there's relative equal lows. That was breached on the 15th of December of 2022. All of this is on the daily chart of ES. Okay. So we've gone down to a low of December 22nd, but we didn't even sweep out the low of November 3rd of 2022. Not that I think that's, that's where it's going, but we've already tried to go higher and we're stalling out in an area after hitting the closing price of December 14th, as I mentioned, which is the reason why I liked the uh, what was it here? 40.30 level. Okay, the 4030.75 was the actual level, but to save typing and make it easy for everybody to follow along, I just gave you 4030. But it was framed on the 14th of December of 2022, that closing price. So if you drag a, a line on that to the right, you'll see that's what we dug up into on Tuesday's trading. And then it was unable to do what? Press higher. And it wilted and went to our sell side that I outlined today. So because of that, I'm thinking that you know we got to start looking for 
inefficiencies because there's no stops except for the daily lows referencing the daily chart. So if you look at the January 13th candle, the middle point of the wick, you want to note that and you want to use the low of January 13th. You want to use the high of January 9th. So those three levels, those are key levels that you should have on your chart going through London tonight and all through tomorrow and going into tomorrow's afternoon session. I'll join you all around probably 1.15, 1 1.20. So I'll be quiet in the morning. I won't be looking at the charts, so there won't be anything for me to prompt you and you know, do anything. That you get y'all worked up or focusing on anything, but those three levels I would have in my chart because, gun to my head, I think it's more likely, even though it's low probability, that it would be more likely to do that than to go higher. And if it goes higher, I can be wrong and I don't care. And if it goes down and hits those levels and provides a trade, I don't care because I'm not going to be there to engage in it, right? So I have this, I've just disarmed anybody that's saying that I use this as a 50 50, look, I'm smart type thing, which is what you see on social media 90% of the time with fakes. I don't do that. So I'm giving you the benefit of my experience and what I do co sign with. Like I would do any other time. I tell you, this is what it's likely to do. Mark this on your chart. And we're going to be aiming for this. And now you see me putting you into specific candles and focusing on where that setup should form. So I'm training your eye. I'm teaching you also to respect the level of risk when the conditions are not favorable for high probability. That's proper mentoring. That's proper learning. That's how you teach someone how to do this themselves. Because I can teach you how to get into a trade. I can teach you money management. I can tell you what the patterns look like and you can know them beautifully. Show you a chart, you can find them real quick. You'll be able to take read 100% when the markets are really favorable. Where will you mess up in conditions like this where it can get ugly? And then that does what? It invites your lack of experience to draw on emotion. When someone has no or next to no experience being consistent or successful in something and they taste failure, they immediately go into defensive. And because this is potentially money, and for men, the transaction of being right or wrong, and men don't like to be wrong. The same individuals that don't want to pull over and ask for directions. I'll pull over and ask for directions. I'm not wasting my time and my money and gas. I'll pull over and ask them, hey, so I get somewhere. I'm never that kind of guy. But all my friends were the kind of guy that never wanted to pull over and ask for fucking directions, which made no fucking sense to me. Common sense is more likely to be in the female traders. Lack of common sense is usually in the men. So when you have this moment of conflicted analysis, the men will want to go in there and prove themselves. I'm better than this. I'll carve out something. I'm going to grab my club like a caveman and I'm going to go out there and bonk something over its head and drag it back to my cave because that's the way we roll. Where women will say, you know what? This isn't worth the risk. I have other things I can do and I'll come back and look at the chart. Did, and it won't cost me any money. It won't cost me any time. It'll be a smaller time investment looking at it in hindsight, and I'll be able to glean whatever it was that took place from a risk-free perspective. Men generally don't like to do that. That's why men generally don't like to backtest because they don't view that as effective club use, like a caveman going out there and bonk something over the head and drag it back to its cave. <laughs> so if you ever get to the point where you can find your spouse or significant other, you know, as a trade partner, where that way you can be accountable to one another. If you're honest with each other and you're able to support one another and try not to compete, I believe that's the only way two minds can come together and be effective. If it's a spousal type thing or a life partner where you're, you know, you're, you're committed to that person and you maybe haven't gotten married yet or whatever. 
uh, but you care about that person and you're trying to carve out a life with them. If you're both on the same page with learning how to do this, you can complement yourselves very well. What will not work, it will not work, is if you have your bro, okay, your buddy, the guy you go to the clubs with, the guys you hang out with on social media, you will find that that usually will present static. And static happens when two things rub together. And men generally are abrasive. So there's going to be static and one's going to want to size up the other. One's going to say that they're better or more right about something. And feelings will get hurt because of that superiority complex that one of them is going to have. And it's unfortunate, but that's just a weakness in men. You want to avoid those things in your trading. So how this fits in this is if you have a condition where the market is more likely to present a frustrating um, lack of precision elements, things that are favorable for low resistance liquidity run signatures, easy trading, let's call it that way, okay? Easy trading days are not going to be found in what I'm showing you in the chart right now because it's problematic. And you don't want to invite the opportunity for you to discover that you should have stayed out. And when you get yourself in that situation, you will feel emotional regret. And you'll do what? You're going to want to replace that feeling of regret, remorse, because you didn't stay out. Because you wanted to do something to see what would happen. Now you found out what would happen. And you don't like what took place. You had a bad experience. And you're going to want to fix it real, real quick because you're thinking if you fix it, that is the Band-Aid and you'll never do that again when it's not true. Because if you can fix it, you're going to think, well, I'll take the chance again because I fixed it the last time. I'm a better trader than I thought I was. So many people, and even myself when I was 20, I thought I could do that. And it just made it worse. So you don't want to invite the opportunity for you to get emotional. So you're not getting – you don't see me emotional. When I'm in a trade, like I, I don't, I really don't give a shit what it's doing. I'm just mon monitoring and managing what it is that I believe it shouldn't do. I'm allowing the time element to let price do what it might do. The probabilities are there for it to reach to a liquidity or an inefficiency, the draw on liquidity. I don't know with 100% assurity that it's going to do that because if I did, I wouldn't use a stop loss and I would go full margin every time. But because there is a hand in this world that manipulates and will disrupt things that are in modes of continuity, you have to preserve yourself with the only shield you have, which is risk and money management. So when you get into these situations and you trade and you force something to occur and try to make a trade happen because you want to see where you measure up with someone with three decades of experience, then you find out you should have done nothing and should have listened to the old man. Now you're in that position where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because if you sit still, you're still going to sit still and regret. But if you sit still for a long enough time, you're going to try to fix the problem that you created for yourself and trade again in conditions that's most likely not going to favor you being profitable or overcoming the drawdown. And you'll do what? You'll increase your lot sizes because you're thinking, okay, the market's not moving that much. So I have to do a larger trade position, and I won't need that much of a move to get myself fixed, Vinny. And it doesn't work like that, does it? You keep blowing out and blowing out and blowing out. That's a classic loser cycle. I know that. I did that when I was 20 years old. And I'm trying to teach you, all of you, how to avoid that. It's a simple process. If you, can I if you can recognize and identify the moment where things are highly unlikely, you stop. And that means you put the pause button on trading even when you're in drawdown. Remove yourself from risk. Come back another day. You have to do that. Because if you don't do it, your broker's not going to do it for you. I can't do it for you. And your spouse or your partner, they're likely not to be able to do it either. So you want to make sure that you're not inviting yourself into conditions that's going to cause you to be emotional 
erratic in your decision making, gamblers. You don't want the gambler driving the car. The gambler is going to say how many times he can go over the yellow line and still not get in an accident. He wants to see how fast he can go before he gets a speeding ticket. He wants to see how many drinks he can drink before he crashes. That's the that's the risk taker that you don't want running your business. The trader that defends the business from the gambler in you and listens to the wisdom and guidance of the analyst in you. That's that's who you are most times as a trader. You're always fighting to keep that balance point between not wanting to be the gambler, the reckless individual, the risk taker, the over leveraging, the more frequent trader than he should have been, and listening to the sound logic that comes from the analyst, the, the model. Once you know your model, that's the analyst in you. You refer back to, okay, what would the analyst have me do? Well, what's your model say? What's the rules? Don't trade in these conditions. Okay, I'm not trading. Not, yeah, you know, I'm not trading. But the game says, but listen, look at this. <laughs> no, you turn the charts off and you go do something else. You deny the gambler any opportunity to start the car because the gambler's drunk. They're drunk on chasing a clout, attention, a feel good, a dopamine hit of being right. The gambler exists to be right. The trader doesn't need to be right. The trader is just focusing on profitability and managing risk. The analyst is just following rules. It's completely devoid of any emotion. It's not trying to prove anything. It has nothing to prove. It's in no competition. It doesn't care, ultimately, who's doing the executions or lack thereof. It's the logic. The model itself. The trader has to manage and wrestle the gambler, which is emotional and psychological tug of war. You're made up of three people an analyst, your model. If you don't have a model, then there's no analyst. If there's no analyst, what are you? A trader that gambles. And you wonder why you're struggling. You wonder why you're losing on live streams. You're letting the gambler compensate for image. You want image to build you up, Benny. Stop trying to impress everybody. Just simply follow sound logic. And when it ain't right, just stop. You'll do far much more damage if you continuously trade like that versus just using sound logic saying, okay, I keep doing the same things over and over and over again, and I keep losing. And you're compounding that pain and frustration if you do it in front of the world. That embarrassment, that shame, that regret, that will fester. And none of that improves a trader. It causes more toxic thinking, and toxic thinking creates an opportunity to do what? More arm wrestling. More Olympic feats. And you're making trading harder than it has to be by inviting those very conditions. And you're doing it in conditions in the marketplace that are not highly favorable for really fast, easy runs. It's choppy right now. And an experienced trader that's been around profitably knows that. Someone that is hit and miss success doesn't see it doesn't recognize it, can't even understand what's going on until afterwards, and then regret, remorse, emotional damage. So there's no shame in saying, I don't know what to do right now, so I have to wait for more information. Think about it. I told you before, this is war. When you turn those charts on, 
you're you're ready to do battle. If you don't look at it like that, because it's not a video game. It's not. It is your livelihood and other people's livelihood. That's not a fucking video game. Okay. You can lose your entire financial condition if you let yourself get reckless. You have to be sober in your decision making, why you're doing something, why you're not doing something. And if the market is highly unfavorable, and I have no shame telling you, I'm I believe I'm pretty good. And I don't feel any anxiety saying right now I don't know what to do next. So therefore I'm gonna sit still. You never hear these other people out there that are claiming to be smart or teachers or, or mentors or gurus or whatever. You never hear them articulate why they don't know how to find something next. They are constantly trying to put something in front of someone saying, here's the next move. There's never a, t there's never a time when they have a lack of a opinion or analysis. They always have something they're trying to do. When someone that knows how to trade has traded profitably and has been consistently doing it for decades or a number of years, they're not going to talk like that. They're not going to try to communicate to the masses that they can always go and do something all the time. That's the problem with social media. It makes you think that's the best thing for you to be doing for your audience or your student base or whatever. The gambler's running the show. You don't want that. You want the trader running the show. And the trader has the responsibility of running the business. Where the gambler is just wanting to test drive daddy's new sports car when he's outside the house. The analyst, it's just the logic. The, the trader respects the wisdom that comes from the analyst or the model. The gambler doesn't respect it. The gambler thinks that they can operate outside the parameters that the model or the analyst would place on the trading business that you're running and feel like they can get away with it. And what happens if it's right? They can make a whole lot more money if you just break the rules and over leverage and buy more contracts or sell more contracts. And I have a couple more minutes left in the day. Let me just go one more time. That's a characteristic of someone that's not consistently profitable. I have seen that so many times over the last 26 years, teaching folks that have that same hallmark example of lack of self-control. And that is a hard, I, I can't teach it. That's something you have to, you have to forge that on your own. And the only way I've ever seen it happen was pain and loss. And usually people with substance abuse problems are so numbed by either alcohol, drugs, they can't see what they're doing to themselves. And in their trading, they self-destruct continuously. And they mask it, they hide it, and they put band-aids and masks on it so that way they can't ever really see it. And they hide it from anyone else. But you can't hide it from someone that can see what it is. I've seen it. Lots of individuals out there in social media, whether they're on YouTube or Twitter or Instagram, you know, whatever it is, Facebook, those characteristics shine through any mask, any attempt to hide it is not successful. You won't be successful in hiding it either. So why invite those opportunities? In short and in closing, we really are closing. When times are like this, when I'm telling you from the analyst perspective, there's no high probability. But if I say I have to decide something for you to study, don't take that as an invitation to say, okay, ICT just gave me the code, code word. You know, we're going short. That's not what I said. I'm saying just study it, but don't have any interest in pushing a button because I'm not going to be pushing a button. I'm not going to come back to you 
during the London session, I'm not going to come to you in the morning and say, hey, you need a dose and show you what I did. I'm going to be physically away from the charts. That's how I manage myself. That's what I needed to learn when I was 20 years old because I felt like I was better than I was when I wasn't really good yet. I wouldn't be able to admit that back then. But knowing what I know now and who I am and what my skill set is now, I, I didn't know anything when I was 20. Even when I started making money, I didn't know shit. So it's imperative that you identify these times. And if I'm telling you I don't have a high probability condition right now, use that, adopt that as your experience right now and just submit to that. I promise you, if you do this this year, the times that I do it, and, and I'm going to explain why, and hopefully I've communicated it clear enough tonight as to why the chart's not communicating it to me in terms of a, a very high probability condition. So since it's doing that, and it's removing the opportunity for high probability, then I have to communicate that to you as a student. Otherwise, I'm not a good mentor. I'm, I'm inviting you to make your own decisions in quicksand. And what's going to happen is you're going to fall into that quicksand tonight or tomorrow, and you're going to get yourself stuck. And then what are you going to do? You're going to panic and you're going to start moving around a lot more. And in quicksand, the more you move around, the faster you sink. So I'm telling you, don't go near the sand. Do something else. I promise you the market will be there tomorrow afternoon. It'll be there on Thursday. You know, it'll be there Friday. There's plenty of opportunities. Plenty. But you have to learn this skill set because this is the one. This one right here. Starts the whole drawdown blown account. Because you're forcing something in conditions that are not conducive for high probability. So. Hopefully, this was insightful to you. Hopefully, I was able to communicate something that was you know, beneficial to you in your, in your development. I promise you that a, a lecture like this um, doesn't have the same impact on a new student than that of someone that has gone through it and they can recognize. I wish I would have heard that when I first started, but it's unfortunate when people are new, they don't appreciate these types of lectures or discussions because they don't have any frame of reference. They don't, they don't know. And they think they're going to be the exception. And as good as I am today, yes, I thought I was the exception when I was 20. And I was not the exception. I was the poster child for failing. Okay. I blew account and blew account and blew account. And I didn't care about it. I didn't, I didn't feel enough pain by blowing the accounts when I was 20. I had to go through a series of those things until I got to the point where I was so frustrated. I had to take a weight every part of trading for a while and for like four or five, maybe even six months almost, I didn't do anything with it. I contemplated quitting. I, at the time I called it quitting, but I was just stopping until I figured out a way that I can raise more money to fund another account. So I really wasn't quitting. I was just frustrated because I didn't have a way of making more money to, to get the money into an account again. So anyway, I've droned on enough. I've communicated what I wanted to communicate tonight. And I want you to know that I'm doing my best to guide you like I would have been wanting someone to guide me. I know what I wanted to have back then. And I know what would have benefited me the most from a mentor. And I'm talking to myself in this discussion. I'm not thinking of my children. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular here. But I'm referring to my younger self as I've talked to you tonight. And if I could go back in time and talk to myself, these are the types of lessons and grabbing by the lapel and shake Michael and say, look, this is where you're going to blow your account. This is what you're going to not see. You're not going to recognize it. And when you get in there and you do something, you're going to get a case of the ass and get mad and try to fix it real fast. And that's going to compound the problem. And then you're going to start hemorrhaging money and you're not going to realize what you're doing is stupid. Like you're literally throwing good money after bad. And even though that it's commendable that you don't fear it, it's lunacy that you don't. 
because it's irresponsibility. It's lack of discipline. It's lack of control. And you need to be able to wrangle yourself in and say, okay, stop. Stop. There's other days where this could be made back rather easy. You don't want to dig yourself into a pit that you can't come back out of. You don't want to bring emotional damage to your decision making because you're going to be thinking about what you did wrong. You dusted another profitable day. You dusted another account. You dusted a whole month or a week's worth of progress doing something that you should have known better not to do. And it all starts on these environments right here, right now. In trading competitions and contests and social media arm wrestling matches all over the world right now, people are trying. Some of them are in secret, working their ass off, and they're going to try to pop out later on. <laughs> I know. But you're all trying to work too hard in conditions that are not favorable. And when they loosen up and the market becomes more favorable, we, me, I will be doing stunning shit in the marketplace. I'm going to show you moves you've never seen before. I'm going to show you equity returns that you've never seen before. But you can't do that in this type of environment. It's stagnant. It's choppy. It's, it's not moving, which is what you need when you really want to parlay accounts out. Now, you're looking at me doing this and thinking, man, I could just do that. This is nothing. This is nothing. This is me working inside small ranges and building what I can with them, what the market's giving me. When these ranges start opening up and they're large, I'm going to be in there taking 85, 90 percent of the daily range. We won't be doing no 20 handle moves. We're going to be doing there several hundred moves because they're coming. We'll have them and I'll be in them riding the whole fucking thing from beginning to end, pyramiding and pyramiding and pyramiding and pyramiding. And there ain't going to be a person on any social media event you're going to come close to what I'm doing this year. So on that note, until next time, be safe.